like that. Wally, do you have Fred? Did you find Fred? I'm here. Hey, hi. Okay. Um, he did. Okay. Yep. So welcome. Um, first of all, um, I'm Mike Covarubias, one of your three co-chairs. Leslie, you all know, sitting in my right. Fred is in the clouds. He's on a phone, so he'll chime in. Um, uh, the first moment of action for me is to uh, issue a huge apology. Uh, our ability to keep ahead of this thing has not been great. So you get these uh, reports and these packages later and later because we and everybody in this room is working harder and harder to get them refined. Uh, so we apologize. We know the process should get this to you sooner. We've just been uh, struggling to do that. So from the leadership group, the moderators, the staff, everybody, we are uh, uh, highly apologetic that we are not so good at keeping the schedules. Um, but this meeting today will be an opportunity for you to converse about what's in it. And if you haven't had a chance to read it, you'll hear. Uh, secondly, uh, we are going to defer, as you saw in the email, the final vote of the recommendation of the technical committee to the steering committee to, we hope, December the 3rd. Uh, today we're going to take a vote, um, and I want to put that in context, but later on. But I just want to go through a couple of basics. So um, I have a habit of looking at the newspaper before I talk in front of everybody, and it, it's invariable that something will pop up. So in addition to the sad news about the tragedy in paradise continuing and the death toll that continues to mount up there, it is another example that the housing crisis we continue to find comes from all kinds of different methods, from the Santa Rosa fire to this fire to the issues we're fighting. So it, I think it puts everything we're doing in perspective. Um, second, in the Chronicle this morning, there are, for those of you who saw it, headline articles called um, battles far from over in state's rental crisis. I'm sure none of you knew that. Um, but uh, it, it's a front page story today, as is Libby's story in calling out the county on the homeless issue. So we are front and center with, you know, the issues of today. And to give you a note of optimism about our process, I read yesterday that Brexit negotiators reach preliminary deal. <laughs> so if they can do it, Right? Okay. So, um, before we get started with public comment, I want to remind you of our goal is to come up with a compact. So it dawned on me I wasn't quite sure what that meant, so I looked it up. And there's a couple of definitions, if you'll bear with me. One is having a dense structure or parts or a unity closely packed or joined. Kind of feels that way in some of the meetings, right? This is my favorite. Being a topological space and especially a metric space with, with the property that for any collection of open sets which contain it, there is a subset of the collection with a finite number of elements which also contains it. And I think that says it all for what we're doing. But in its simplest term, a, co a compact is an agreement or covenant between two or more parties. And that's what we're trying to do. We are trying to come up with an agreement that all the parties in the room can share uh, in an effort to push this down the, down the field towards the steering committee and then legislation. So with that, um, I will come back at the end of the process. You'll hear today from the moderators going through the, the, uh, the items, and we'll start off with public comment if we have some. Ken? Yes, thanks, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Ken Kirky with MTC and ABAG. We have several uh, public speaker cards, uh, and I'll, I will apologize in advance if I mispronounce your name, which I'm quite likely to do. Uh, the first uh, speaker is Shajuti Hussain, followed by Ken Bukowski. Hi, I'm Shajuti Hussain from Public Advocates, and I'm really glad that CASA has brought together so many perspectives into one room. Um, it has also recognized the three Ps. But to end on a high note, I'd like to see the final CASA Compact be a set of policies with major components rather than these fine details, because these detailed minutiae are very brittle and subject to change. Um, something that could come out of CASA as well as a legislative drafting committee 
who would work on these details in a more transparent and accountable process. Um, our process here just doesn't seem to lend itself well to talking about details that are constantly changing and people are coming to these details with different levels of understanding and different perspectives. So I really encourage you to think of having a final draft to be something that highlights these major components, um, maybe just a few pages rather than like, you know, a long list of details. Um, so please keep that in mind as you're working through the final um, steps of the process. Hi, uh, I had two comments. Uh, I was wondering, with, with all this housing production, uh, that's a lot of growth. And, uh, are the local jurisdictions really ready to accept this, this amount of new growth? Uh, you know, how are they going to pay for services? Uh, and the other thing is, uh, you know, looking for a new source of money, uh, the state of New Jersey is pursuing uh, collecting money on sports book uh, gambling. And that would be a big source of money here if that could happen in California. So maybe that could be used for housing. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Joseph Smook, followed by Tess Wilborn. Thank you. Good morning. Joseph Smook with the Housing Rights Committee of San Francisco. Um, I just want to make a few comments because I think that there's been some discussion through this, uh, uh, this process that may be misunderstanding the west side of San Francisco a little bit. Um, uh, I've been the director of the West Side kind of expansion of Housing Rights Committee services, uh, providing tenant counseling to the West Side of San Francisco. The Richmond District, um, in particular, is seeing gentrification and displacement, and has typically been associated with other parts of the city, especially the eastern neighborhoods like the Mission, Soma, and Petrero Hill. Those eastern neighborhoods were traditionally working class neighborhoods with blue collar jobs. The exodus of blue collar jobs and the mass evictions that have displaced working class people have made these neighborhoods inaccessible to everyone except the wealthiest. So people for the past few years have been uh, starting to look at the Richmond district, a neighborhood that isn't served by light rail or BART and has escaped much of the real estate speculation of the prior waves of gentrification. Prices are escalating in the Richmond and so are evictions. Contrary to perceptions of the Richmond, we are a neighborhood of more than 65% renters and mostly multi-unit buildings. The 38 Geary bus and its parallel muni lines are some of the busiest bus lines in California. We might not have any high rises in the Richmond and only a few mid-rise buildings, but it is still very dense and the population is increasing. We see so many people in accessory dwelling units and in roommate and subtenant situations who are stressed by their overcrowded living conditions. All you have to do is take the 38 bus any time of day to see how densely populated the Richmond is and how the density is increasing. It might not look like Soma, but let's remember that so many of those new condo high rises in Soma are vacant. It looks dense, but those shiny new high rises are not necessarily even housing anyone. We know that real people are actually living in the Richmond district. The BRT, the bus route of transit on, the, on Geary may be on the way, but the bus corridor is already bursting. The BRT won't even be fully implemented for another five years or so. It will shutter businesses, as has been proven on Van Ness, that support our immigrant and working class residents. It will encourage speculation that will increase evictions even more. We have had Housing Rights Committee providing tenant counseling in the neighborhood since 2016. They have multiple, we, sorry, have multiple language capacities and we have San Francisco's rent stabilization ordinance to work with, but it's not enough. The Ellis Act owner move in evictions, long-term renovations and illegal B Airbnb conversions and legal Airbnb conversions are forcing people out at an alarming rate. We've been working with our supervisor's um, office, District Supervisor Sandra Lee Fewer trying to build affordable housing. There are so few development sites in the Richmond, but these projects are slow to start. If you incentivize market rate housing, all the sites will be gone and more and more people will be displaced from what is now one of the last working class neighborhoods in San Francisco. Thank you. Tess Wilborn, followed by Rick Hall. Good morning. I'm a neighborhood activist, housing activist here in San Francisco with a lot of different connections. I am very upset about the, the compact that you are proposing 
the content of it that I know about already. There is more I know that I need to learn. This is an undemocratic process. The notices of the meetings do not go out to the general public, but you're proposing to tell the general public what the plan for housing is going to be and how it's going to be paid for. This is not the way to do it. We have elected officials who should be doing this kind of work. Um, there are so many things wrong with even noticing this meeting. The links the, to the documents were not valid, but the noticing did not really go to the general public. Uh, there is so much more. I will allow my friends and colleagues to speak more. But remember, when you're talking about housing, you're also talking about water supplies, you're talking about transportation, you're talking about open space, and what is the carrying capacity of any given area. So please think again. Rick Hall, followed by uh, Steve Levy. Uh, Rick Hall, San Francisco Cultural Action Network. This process, well, even the definition of compact that was read this morning, when it was read, I went, yeah, that could also be the definition of conspiracy. And, you know, frankly, the, the secrecy from the public of these proceedings, including the broken link, you know, I couldn't even read the compact, you know. So this process is undemocratic. And this process is creating something that's even more, even more takes away our representative democracy. You know, when Heminger, and I'll paraphrase, says, oh, well, the challenge is going to be to take the people's money without letting them vote for it. Yeah. You know, I think there's a lot of underlying motivations here that, <coughs> frankly, do not fit with desires of the various communities and people that are going to be impacted. You know, so I, I'm opposed to even creating a compact, which you know, just sort of gives this process more credibility, even though it means nothing. So anyway, I suggest you rethink it, you get more public comment, and in your compact, if you create it, you know, number one ought to be divert, moving, encouraging businesses to not over-concentrate in the Bay Area. Because all we do is invite business, invite housing, concentrate housing, raise the costs <coughs> of, in the area, and then we have to find billions to mitigate that. Businesses should spread themselves through satellite offices, and we should encourage that here. Steve Levy, followed by Tim Frank. I have three things that might be added to an already good list of ideas. My city, which is really affluent, Palo Alto, is struggling with long-term budget deficits. I bet that applies to most everybody in the room. You have a whole host of wonderful policies that ask cities to give up fees, to give up property tax revenue, to give up surplus land, all in the name of promoting housing. These are really good. You have one line, if I read it right, at the end, it's saying maybe you'd help pay back the cities for the money they're losing by looking at Prop 13. I would sure add to the regional agency or a statewide bond money to directly backfill so you don't make cities enemies. Um, I really worry about that in Palo Alto. My city has a legal housing element, but it's a farce. No one will build at that level. So every project in my city, and I don't know about your city, needs a zoning change. Um, Denise and Derica, I'm not clever enough to have read through to see whether you have covered all of my worries. But I know that 
triplexes and duplexes and row houses will not be built near transit stations in my city. They'll be built in residential neighborhoods. And I don't know whether you have that covered. I don't know whether you have enough to really encourage or force cities to change zoning to make some of this stuff happen, except around transit stations. And in my city, and regrettably, Leslie told me in Cupertino, the not in my backyard people won the election. And in my city, I don't know about your city, those people take the anti-developer language and vitriol and turn it into anti-housing because they double or triple the fee on housing, they add parking, they add retail, all in the name of dirty developers, but they really want to make housing impossible to fund. So I really, despite the fact that you tease me, Steve, in my community, I see the anti-development stuff playing right into the hand of the not in my backyard people to make housing projects, including a low income project that I've now spent 200 hours on, not feasible, and that worries me. Tim Frank followed by Will Dominique. So I wanna take a deep breath here. Um, the motivation that got people around this table to begin with at the beginning was a, a desire to have a dialogue, uh, to cooperate, which is, I think, a very good instinct. We understand that there is a problem that is larger than any of us that we can't solve on our own. Everybody has to work together to make this work. Um, the uh, volunteer commitment I've seen from people around the table is actually quite a breath of fresh air. This is good. And the fact that we're doing this before a legislative session, before there's a bunch of bills out there that have a bunch of flaws because people didn't think them through enough, is good. This is how you actually prepare for good policy making. So I think everybody should be proud of the contribution that they've made here. I also think that there is a ways to go. Um, at the beginning of this process, almost everybody in the room indicated that they wanted to ha establish very aggressive goals, that they wanted to think big about what they wanted to accomplish. We have a housing supply shortage. We have a problem with the way the housing, uh, existing housing stock is managed that puts people under stress when, when, there, uh, when gentrification comes to the neighborhood. We have a series of different problems that require policy solutions that are often larger than just at the, the municipal level. And I think working together, we can find some solutions to that. The, you know, putting on the table a, an emergency rent cap, that's a pretty exciting concept. Um, finding a, what, more uh, sources of funding for affordable housing, a lot of us have been working on that for a long time, of putting all the heads in this room uh, together and helping work on that, that's a really important thing. <laughs> Figuring out how to break down some of the barriers in the zoning code to help make it cheaper and, and uh, more efficient to build housing is a critically important thing. Figuring out how to build the construction workforce is a critically important thing. If we talk about the numbers that we're looking at, California is building about 100,000 units a year right now, and we know that that's about half what we'd really like to be building. We need to be building both more market rate and more affordable housing, and to do that, we need a larger residential construction workforce. That has to be a piece of the two. As we think about growing the, the, uh, the workforce, it would be important for us to figure out how we grow it. If that increment is focused, is, is driven by uh, joint labor management apprenticeship programs and it's training people for a middle class career, that's an important contribution to the, to the table as well. Keep in mind that 20% of Latino male workers in California are construction workers. And Tim, whether they have an opportunity Tim, could you for, wrap, wrap it up? Yeah, I'll Thank wrap you. it up. Um, you know, a, a middle class career or whether they get stuck in uh, uh, a setting where they're subject to wage theft, they're subject to uh, work with, that, with very little in the way of either health insurance coverage or retirement benefits. That's really important too. And we can all actually think about which course we wanna go. And if all of the streamlining and et cetera that we build in here that is intended to increase production 
is structured so that it also incentivizes the use of high road labor practices. That will help us get the production that we want and help make sure that the workers get paid uh, wages that will help them afford housing. That's an important part of the, the, the puzzle. I think that we could get that done, and I hope that that is the direction that we go. Okay, next speaker is Will Dominey, followed by Fernando Marti. Hi, everybody. Will Dominey at Bar High. Bar High is the coalition of local public health departments in the region. It's our responsibility to look at and improve um, population health. So that's the, popu that's the health of all people in the Bay Area. Um, and we have been working on housing a long time. Um, I brought, for instance, today uh, a new brief we put out with the Federal Reserve around family health and housing. Uh, we've also been a very active participant in the CASA process, both bringing the health perspective and then supporting uh, Fred and the San Francisco Foundation. Um, and I just wanted to note today, you should have in front of you uh, a health analysis that we just conducted. Um, as folks have noted, the timeline of the CASA process is fast, so it was a quick scan. Um, it's meant to complement the work that MTC is doing um, on impact analysis and racial impact analysis. Um, and we're hoping that it can provide you um, with some assistance in thinking through the policies that are in front of you. Um, you can see um, near the end there's a table with some of the analysis on it where we ran all the different policies through a set of health criteria, health and housing criteria. Um, and um, then you'll see on the front um, is a series of recommendations to improve the compact. Um, and I just wanted to quickly note some of those. First, um, keeping our solutions at scale. Um, we are close, but we're not yet to uh, where we need to go um, to actually address the health and housing crisis uh, that we're facing. Um, so we actually need to bump up the amount of funding we're talking about, um, and in particular bump up um, the amount that's going to protections and preservation. Um, we need to focus on housing quality, um, thinking about how we build in, especially in the preservation programs, um, a connection to some of the health programs that we work with um, in terms of code enforcement, asthma, weatherization, and so I'll be bringing some ideas uh, when we get to implementation on that. We need to really continue to pri prioritize the tenant protections section, um, which again is already strong, and we need to do that. Um, that is both important on its own right, and then also really important in the context of the market rate policies that are being proposed, um, where we face potential of displacement. So we really need to be focusing on um, tenant protections and getting those right. Um, and I will end there, but you can find kind of the detailed recommendations um, on, well, near the end. Um, and I did want to also mention that I've got, and I know I am, need to wrap up, but I have gotten some comments already. Thank you very much for them. Denise, continue to look to be in dialogue around how we balance uh, production and protection right. And Scott, I think, brought up really rightly um, that we need to also be thinking about labor standards um, and how we're um, addressing the needs of working families and workers. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Fernando, followed by Peter Papadopoulos, who was the last speaker. Hi there, my name is Fernando Marti with the Council of Community Housing Organizations in San Francisco. First of all, I wanna commend you all for getting to this point and getting to this point with a consensus around the three Ps, around the importance of linking tenant protections, housing preservation, and production and that those three Ps and these policies are all interconnected and they all have to move forward together. Um, and it's been really uh, great for me to have conversations with folks like Jonathan and Denise and others around those three Ps and our consensus around the importance of those. Um, I'm very worried about the process and the speed at which we are now at a uh, straw poll, I guess a preliminary vote. Uh, my understanding was that there were going to be a series of conversations continuing through December to get in depth through each of these pieces. And now it seems that um, you're moving very quickly to vote on something when you have just today been presented with a health and equity analysis that should inform how you move forward and how these policies uh, move forward. Um, I think it is important um, to have real public participation, real dialogue with a broader public before you start talking about what these pieces are, and in particular to talk to folks about how these pieces are going to be implemented. What is the strategy? 
We know that there are already pieces of some of this that are moving forward in Sacramento. There are discussions happening, and they are the market rate production pieces. Um, and that's what it is. But our compact, I think, that we've all agreed to is that all pieces move together or they don't move together, right? We want, we do not want to just have market rate production pieces without having the funding for affordable housing in place, without having rent caps that really mean something to folks in place. Um, so it would be great to have our state elected officials be here, I don't know if they will be here this afternoon, and say we agree with this compact and we're going to move all three parts, all 17 pieces together, or none move. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter Papadopoulos, followed by Michelle, who is now the last speaker. Good morning. Uh, my name is Peter Papadopoulos. I'm with the Mission Economic Development Agency here in San Francisco. Um, and I want to uh, particularly follow up on some of those sentiments by uh, Choo Choo that you just heard. Um, uh, if you don't know us, we are uh, an economic development agency here in the city. We are an affordable housing development agency. We build low to moderate income housing. We are fiercely Yembies. We are for equitable development in our backyard, and we are all for it. And that's what we want to make sure is happening in processes like these. And particularly, we have concerns here about this process and the speed of the process of what's happening. I think that um, hearing that we're suddenly moving forward to some sort of straw poll vote when we had presumed there was a different process in place is a bit alarming, to be honest. And we think that it's very, very critical that this be more vetted more publicly, that it go beyond a single negotiation session, that these elements be vetted for public input, that our city officials be brought into the process, that all of this happen in a much more transparent and frankly, a slower, more thoughtful process, which is what is needed to reverse the fierce trends we're seeing and produce the kind of equitable outcomes that I hope we're all in agreement that we're after that we're after equitable growth, that we're after safe growth, that we're after growth that acknowledges what the history in our most vulnerable communities in places like San Francisco is. And I think it's something that's very doable and I strongly encourage us to pause, pause on things like taking a vote, pause on driving forward with any, speed is not the solution we're after, this is a huge long-term issue we're facing and take our time and let's do it right, thank you. All right, final speaker, Michelle. Just in the nick of time. Uh, hey, Michelle from Six Winds and Urban Habitat. Um, I, what I'm holding right now is uh, there's a lot happening in this process that isn't clear and transparent and accountable. And I got off bar and I saw someone sleeping on a manhole cover for warmth. And I also was in an observing a negotiation meeting where someone was talking from this table about profit margin. And it's, 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 I think I'm, I, yeah, I wasn't, that's what I'm coming into the room with. Um, and I'm not doing this to be performative. It's just a really heavy feeling knowing that the details matter and this isn't the right mix of people because those who are impacted by this crisis are not even in the room. And y'all are sorting out through really, really important details that talk, that's centering profit margin over fucking people's lives. And I think that's just, I'm so disappointed. I'm disappointed by the facilitation of this process and how fast it's moving without any real transparency or accountability. And those details that you're going to be discussing today really matter at a material level. I, I think that's like all I have the capacity to say because I'm sort of at a loss. I've been so involved in this process trying to be a good advocate and I, I feel like I failed, so. So um, it's, it's hard to have, you know, this kind of dialogue um, with the stress and the frustration that a lot of people feel. Um, I'll, let me see if I can talk about a little bit of it. Um, first of all, don't fear that this body is going to go enact legislation. This body was put together with a cross-representation of a lot of people representing all three Ps. 
um, with the intention of recommending to a steering committee uh, its ideas on how to move the housing agenda at all levels forward. The, the steering committee will then do what it's going to do. It then has the MTC board and the ABAG board. But more importantly, <clears throat> from a legislative process, we have no authority. Uh, the legislators who have been actively talking to us from our Bay Area caucus want to proceed with exactly what you described, a package. They want to put all three Ps together. They want to vet them. They want to do what they do. You've seen Scott Wiener do bills. You've seen David Chu do bills. There are a lot of bills that uh, Jim Bell, that get vetted. That is where this is headed. So I, I want to just assuage the fear that this is a rebel cause that is going to pass laws next month. We're not. We're going to do our best job to have taken the last 18 months and put together a compact, which is somewhere between too detailed and not detailed enough, too bold and not bold enough. Um, and, and so you get the sense. There's no right answer. This is art. So we're creating art. And so I think what you will see from today, we're going to walk through the six, um, the, the three Ps that are for protection, the two Ps for preservation, the rest that are for producing all types of housing, both affordable and, and market rate, which was our original goal. That was what we set up to do. So we're going to continue on that. We think that um, there's some meaty details in there. They may be too much or not enough. It's, it's hard to say. But um, let's get through this session. Um, let's see how we feel at the end. And um, as I said, we're not set to vote for real until later. And then we send it on to the steering committee. So I just want to calm the, the sensitivities that we may be overreaching too quick, too soon, with great authority, which we have none. So with that, I just want to make sure everybody knows Steve Heminger just walked in a little bit ago. And this was his baby. And I think, I think this is a bold move. I think this is a bold adventure to try to get housing and MTC on the same page to, 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 to as it says, to house the Bay Area. So with that, uh, we're going to ask the four moderators who you know intimately, uh, Derica, Jennifer, Denise, and where's is Linda here? Is Linda not here? Linda's not here. Okay, so the three uh, to walk through the proposals um, and give us some guidance as to what are not finished yet. There's some to be negotiated. You'll see in columns, but it'll give you a sense from from 20,000 feet on down to 10,000 feet uh, where we're headed. Jennifer. Is your mic on for? Uh, yeah, oh, sorry. No, I'm just. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if it would be. Uh, one of the things I was hearing uh, in the comments uh, that maybe we need to address uh, before we get into the details of the, the compact is is a little bit about the process um, and how we want to. Um, come out of this conversation uh, with some clarity about process. And uh, I know folks didn't get to see, um, maybe haven't had the time to read the term sheets and either, and might also need to create some space for that. So I just wonder if, if we might ask permission to, to, to spend some time on that at the front end. Sure, um, I, as I said, I, rather I, than the we, back end, because it's probably a, on people's minds. We did a lousy job comments. getting information out timely, and I didn't know there was a broken website. But uh, sure. Yeah, it, it, it's on my mind um, after hearing the public comments. So I'm wondering if that, if there is a sense of that in the room. I'm not sure if what you're asking. I, I mean, I, what I tried to say was what I thought we were our process was. We, today we're going to go around the room if we get through this and sort of get an idea how people feel about the, the elements. And then we have another, whatever that is, three weeks to c continue conversations, Yeah. meet with uh, the individuals, and try it again. So that is what is on the, the table. How does it work? Oh, Andrea? Uh, 
Should I go? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Sure. I'm not sure what the, was, sig what the sure signal Jennifer is today. Was um, <laughs> I want to I want to yeah. follow up with what Jennifer said because I I do think it's not the process of where we're going with it. It's the process of building consensus. I think is what maybe she's addressing. Um, you know, having participated in uh, in what I thought was a very productive session on on Sunday. Um, someone, I forget who made a comment that said, well, gee, this just feels like another technical committee meeting. Um, and it was, and it was a very good one, but there was no, you know, if we're talking about negotiations, whatever that means, it's a very difficult process. I don't know, I, I saw Amy's here. We've been sitting together um, with the affordable housing community and small business folks for 18 months working out uh, an agreement uh, around labor standards on, the product, on, on A1, and it's been... Uh, I think a very productive but difficult process because you're getting folks to really change a whole mindset and that's us and that's the affordable housing community and it's difficult. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, we have to maybe define what we mean by consensus, what we mean by trying to come up with a negotiation uh, so that we can provide a recommendation to the steering committee and then and they do with what they want ultimately in terms of setting some kind of a a, a regional platform that goes to Sacramento. So I kind of want to second that a little bit. I don't know if I've got the answers, but I do think that, um, you know, if now we've extended yet the so-called vote to next month, um, I'm not sure what's going to change really between now and next month that's going to get, you know, because is, a vote, what does that mean? Does that mean, hey, 60 percent support it and 40 don't? That's not, that's not a, a good outcome. I mean, we really have to have almost consensus around the table and what what we're ultimately recommending, or we just say, you know, hey, we let the, 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 the chairs here get all the information and they make the recommendation, you know, based on that. I mean, we have to, I think, define that a little bit. Amy? Yeah, I wanted to um, put in another plug for, it would be really helpful to understand the process. So what happens, so there there's some process that happens between now and, and the time that we actually take a formal vote. There's some process that happens where the steering committee takes a formal vote. Then it goes to the MTC commission. It goes to the ABAG board. What what happens in that process? I have a better idea of what happens when it gets to the legislate legislators and the legislature. All you know becomes a meat grinder. But but I just I want to understand what we hope to see because I. I'm so grateful for Denise and, and Jennifer and Derica and Linda for explaining the compact items. I feel like we've been in a lot of meetings and have heard the explanation. I mean, and, and I'm happy to hear it again today. I just don't know that that is actually going to get us to that place of like, how are we making collective decisions on it? Because I'm at the point where I understand the compact, all the pieces of it. What I don't understand is how do they fit together? Because maybe on one and three, I'm willing to give up this because I'm going to get something else on five, six, and seven. Or maybe I let go of something. You know, it, what what is that? And then um, that's also overlaid with we don't have control over most of these things except for maybe what MTC is able to do, maybe. Um, so, so that would be helpful to me if we could just dive a little bit more into what we expect from the phases of process before we go through the content items. It'll help me to have a lens on the, I mean, maybe if it's only me, that's okay, but if it'll help me to understand the content items to look for those negotiation points, the give and take points. So let's do any more comments. Denise, did you want to say well, something? Well, I just wanted to offer Steve, maybe a way through this moment, because I don't think, you know, this process, to say it's organic would be an understatement, right? There's, there's no agenda. There's no list of meetings. There's no meeting topics. Um, people say, we got to work on this, and a bunch of people go work it, try to work it through. So that's great, because you can respond quickly and have meaningful conversations, and it's really, it's not a public agency in the, in the grand sense where you have a big paid staff that can make sure you run a series of typical public meetings. This is a recommendation of a bunch of technicians that will go to public officials and then go through the typical public process. So I think what we're going to get out of this, I hope, starting today, is do we have the right headlines of a work product that we need to work on? Are these the right things we need to work on? And then what are we missing in the details or what is still a problem with people? 
And this set, and I don't expect that everyone is going to have read this or even fully gotten their brains around it by today, but this document responds to the last six to eight weeks of meetings and online comments and sidebar conversations because it isn't a negotiation. It, it, it wasn't set up to be that way. It's set up to be an advisory body where you do the best you can to get as much consensus as you can and then you hand it off to a public body and a public process. That's how this is going to end up happening, I think. So if that pr process works as poorly as it does, and I think the, the step after today is flag the details that still aren't working for people and, and assign some folks to go work them through and figure out who's still, um, uh, you know, who's, who this still isn't working for and try to work them through. Some of them, I think, are fairly well accepted. We don't need to do that. Some of them are, are far more complicated and we need to do a lot of work on them. So ideally today, we, we collectively say, yeah, this is kind of the right package. And when we say package, we mean they all go. CASA introduces 10 or 11 titles for bills. And then we as a group continue to have this conversation with the state legislators. And they start to take over leadership of the things that are state legislation. Yep. And then these conversations continue. Because that is the public process that exists for state legislation. So if that, if, if that kind of works as a concept, then I think the work we can do together today is to say, yeah, this is the package, the, you know, which we have in front of us. We can kind of present that and go through it. And these are the things we still have, we, we still have some real concerns about that we want to work through. And then if that, we can get through that, then in the next 30 days, we'll do our best to work through the things that need to be worked through as best we can. Because, okay. I, I, you know, I, some of the speakers said we should take more time, we should slow down. In my mind, when I see people sleeping in their cars on the street, I don't think about taking more time and slowing down. I think about now's the time, a year ago was the time, two years before that was the time, and so we should take the time we have and make the best use of it and come to the best agreement we can and know that it won't be perfect, and we'll hand it off to the legislature, and they'll continue to work it through. So that's, that's my proposal for process. And... If folks can live with that, I suggest we move on to talk about the compact. Steve, did you want to say something? Yeah, I would. Uh, and I, I think it's appropriate that we're pausing here and talking about next steps. Uh, and the fact is, this process is complicated. Um, when MTC and ABAG convened CASA, they took a risk. And the risk was that CASA would come up with some ideas that maybe MTC and ABAG didn't like. Personally, I think if CASA doesn't come up with ideas that somebody doesn't like, it didn't do its job. Uh, we're in a crisis, but we're also in a stalemate, in my opinion. And that stalemate consists in large part uh, by the people around the room and in this room listening to us. Uh, and we've got to figure out a way, if there is a way, to break out of it. And I think ultimately, as Mike said earlier, our state legislators are going to be the decision makers about how much progress we make. Our job, I believe, is to provide them some good advice based on evidence about things that we think might do that. So maybe just to try to sketch again, I think Mike did a pretty good job a few minutes ago, but maybe just to sketch again what the process is from this point forward. And I would echo Denise's point. Uh, we said about 18 months ago that we wanted to finish by the end of this calendar year. And we're trying to do that. We haven't sped things up to do that. We have been working through issues as we go. And we're trying to finish when we said we would. We've got a new governor who's just been elected and a new legislature. Uh, and we want to take advantage of that opportunity. So. Um, as a result of the progress that we made, I agree with Andreas, uh, the progress that we made last week, but the fact is we didn't make enough progress. We acknowledge that what we thought would be a voting meeting today shouldn't be. Um, and I think what we're talking about is more of a straw poll or a gut check uh, than a vote. Um, but we do have a two-step process here with a technical and a steering committee. Uh, and the steering committee are the policymakers, including the chairs of both MTC and ABAG. Um, 
And our job, I believe, the technical committee, is to provide them advice. And I agree also with Andreas, if we end up saying 60% of you this is a good thing and 40% it's a bad thing, we haven't done our job either in that case. So knowing that we weren't ready to act today, uh, we're scheduling an additional meeting of this committee, uh, I believe it's December 3rd, uh, that will enable you to have much more time with this information than you've had today. Um, once that occurs, then the steering committee for CASA is scheduled to make its final action in middle of December. Uh, and that will be a vote of the policymakers who are on that committee. And there are policymakers, both public and private. Now, it's true that subsequent to that, the plan is to present the CASA compact, as it's finally agreed to, to both the MTC and ABAG boards. But that is not for the purposes of those boards approving it. It is for the purposes of those boards approving whether their executive leadership, their chair, their president, is going to sign the thing. Um, and again, that was part of the risk that MTC and ABAG took in convening this process. Um, so I don't believe that you or the steering committee should consider their role as putting something together that MTC and ABAG can approve. It's putting something together that all of the stakeholders, all of the various interests can live with uh, to see whether we could lock arms and go to Sacramento and make some progress. Uh, so, uh, Amy, I hope that helps explain the process, uh, which, as I say, is complicated. Our boards, my boards, are used to disposing of matters. Here's a thing, <laughs> here's an idea, I'm proposing it to you, you dispose of it. That is not what CASA is. CASA is something that MTC and ABAG are part of, but it's not a wholly owned subsidiary. Uh, and we wanted to take advantage of the incredible amount of expertise around this table uh, that was outside our building uh, and bring them here and see what we could learn. Um, and I think we've all been learning together. Uh, and we're going to do the best we can, as Denise said, in the next few weeks uh, to see whether we can land this airplane. Um, in the meantime, uh, I, I, I hope we can move on today to discuss some of the specific ideas that have been developed. Kaylin, did you have a thought? Um, yes, it was a while ago, but <laughs> the, I just, I agree with Amy that the details are super helpful. I think we need to have these things fleshed out in detail in order to really know what we mean by each thing. That said, the details will change, either outside this room, by the steering committee, or by legislators when they get it and it goes through the meat grinder. So I feel like on these, we need to focus more on like the principles and the non-negotiables that we will basically say we no longer support this if these things do or don't happen. Because otherwise, like to, to assume that the details are going to remain the same is foolish. So I just think that that's, I think the details are important to us to be able to flesh out the non-negotiables and to be able to present those details as a first crack. But I think that without talking about the principles and the non-negotiables, which we should keep relatively small, um, I, I just think otherwise I just won't feel comfortable because I just know whatever details we iron out are just not going to remain. And then I won't be in the room. None of us will be in the room. None of the people who are affected by this issue will be in the room when the details change. Um, so that would be my suggestion on process. Anybody else? That's, that's an excellent. Real self. Sorry. Tamika. Oh, could you guys do that sign thing up so I can tell who wants to speak? Thank you. Tamika, were you next? So, um, Not everybody. Uh, I, I completely admire um, uh, the efforts of all those who have been um, uh, totally engaged weekends, evenings, extra to their jobs uh, in trying to pull this together. I share a sense of urgency. Um, for anyone who has a non-negotiable demand, uh, or need that is not addressed by this um, package uh, as it as we all absorb it. Um, I would really beg for the alternative um, solution uh, that would 
uh, achieve the region's housing needs uh, and be consistent with that non-negotiable uh, position. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if we're not going to do, and I get it, why we may not want to do it, uh, if we're not going to try to increase density around transit because of displacement issues, where are we going to put people? Uh, if we're not going to um, do inclusionary zoning, um, uh, what are we going to do? Um, uh, I just think all of us have spent too much time on this effort, and many of you have spent more time than I have, um, to uh, get anyone off the hook for saying no to something without actually saying what is the solution. Um, and if the solution is killing Prop 13, then um, it's like killing climate change. It's completely outside our authority to, um, uh, uh, to reach that kind of um, impasse. So that's my suggestion. So Mika, I think you were next. Um, I was just going to observe that it does feel like we're getting to a place where the rubber is about to meet the road, and I feel like we are uh, getting to our fear place right, where, where everybody's like, oh shit, it means we got to do something. Um, so we actually need to be about it. We, we really do. We have sit around this table for 18 months talking on behalf of our constituencies, our sectors, uh, our own investments of time and professional commitments to these issues, and I feel like we're getting to a place where we're unraveling, where, where, where we are... Um, nervous about what it actually means to get past our humanity around this and actually focus on the people that we say we care about. There, there is a sense of urgency and we all the bullshit, the, the details and the nuts and bolts, if it's not doing harm to the people who are already harmed in our communities, can we get over it? Can we set it aside? If it is doing harm, to, to Caitlin's point, to Amy's point, let's know what the harm is. And it's not harm to your industry or your outcomes. It's harm to the people that we say we care about. So I just wanna lift us up and like, now is the time to not cower in the face of hard, work. We, we have to stay strong and hold arms and be willing to um, show up around our principles and, and do something about it. Otherwise, let's be clear, the Bay Area will be over. I'm, I'm just for real. Like, I've been at this table contemplating whether or not I move to Mexico or wherever, wherever I might go uh, for my little piece of the world because I worry about the future of the Bay Area and I was hopeful about the CASA process because all of us recognize we're at a crisis. This is like we've hit rock bottom. So not to preach, but I do want to encourage us to hear our, our colleagues in the room, but also be so willing to be courageous and, and willing to try to hold the work and commitment we've all shown up and be about the work. All right, can we take a vote? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Scott and then Derek up follow that <laughs> yeah that's a challenge um, I'm looking at the calendar and I'm seeing the timeline between now and December 3rd and and we've got some some meetings to do right we the from our perspective it feels like some of the labor issues having to do with building trades labor is being defined as problems rather than as part of the solution. And that obviously requires dialogue over the next 12 days in order to try to overcome that. Because the initial idea of this compact was that they were, we were gonna forge ideas, then we were gonna try to hold hands, and not only just make recommendations, but make commitments of political capital and to ask others to put political capital on the line. And so we can't back away from the magnitude of the undertaking, or we get left with situations like we see up in the Sonoma County Fire District, where 2,800 Santa Rosa houses were destroyed and 56 have been rebuilt in, the, in a year's time. So we need to confront these, I am, and I'm saying that the process is going to be one of, of intense dialogue before the third, because if we just walk into the third, 
I'm, I'm not optimistic about us having, not because the issues aren't ones that we should be coming together with, it's because of that, are we, are we committing ourselves to something that's going to have real consequences uh, and not blow up the future of political and policy making um, around land use policies for generation afterwards because we have failed uh, to really move the needle of, in, in terms of people's lives and the economics of their lives. So, so that's an invitation uh, to, to take a lot of meetings in between now and the third. Thanks. Derica? So, um, yes, lots of urgency. In the, I like the idea of this, of a legislative drafting committee process of some sort. So just to put that out there, like I do think we have to think about Scott's point, 12 days. Some of this is gonna go beyond 12 days. Um, and so I just want to offer that there, we might want to sit down and decide, figure out how proposing an actual shuttle diplomacy process and with whom. Um, I think we have to remember that it's not as if the, we're, we're like mining for gold for the perfect policy solution. I mean, policy and politics are dynamic and change and like I see CASA's great opportunity as a political vehicle to break Steve's point about stalemate. Um, and that takes, anyway, there's, there's another step, but, but we gotta, I think I'll, I will put some time into thinking about what that should be. And I think we gotta figure out one milestone, maybe the third. I think there's probably some stuff post the third with the steering, like that also needs to be fleshed out. Um, and so I think we just need to, yeah, anyway, think about that and think Thank about level of detail to match the post process. Um, at what level of detail do we need to be by the third versus by the steering committee versus, right? Like, anyway. So. I can set aside Thank every you. day the week after Thanksgiving, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, th I'll set aside every day in the weekend, I'll take as many meetings as people wanna have I, I challenge everyone else in this room to make the same commitment because part of the reason why we haven't had a lot of meetings is because it's been really hard to get any meetings. So if people really want to have a lot of meetings, do what Tamika said. It's time to double down now, put your other stuff aside and give it a week and we'll figure it out. We can use our office or this space. I am happy to meet and you, people who met with me know this. As often, as long as you want until we wrestle it to the ground, we figure it out. So. Clear your calendars and assume that you're not doing anything else that week but CASA, because that's what it'll take, a lot of meetings in that week. Okay, thanks. So let's, let's try to get to the agenda okay. of what's on the... Hey, Mike. Fred? Mike, can I get in the queue? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I'll be brief because it's hard to be on the phone, but I think Steve did a good job of talking about kind of what's on the horizon, what the next steps are. I wanted to offer up a little bit of what I think today's task is. Um, you know, we've had a lot of opportunities to dive into the details on individual term sheets and ideas. Um, and we know that we're at the point where there are some that have too much detail, some that may not have enough detail. And I think Caitlin Thomas the right, we need to make sure we hit the right point. I think it would be helpful today because what we haven't done uh, it's gotten people's um, feedback on the total package. So what we're looking for today from you all is whether we are in the right direction or in the ballpark with everything together, but we also need feedback on the areas where there's too much detail and the areas where there's not enough detail. And I think if we were to do those three things, it would help us to get through the rest of the steps to see the way out. Good point, Fred, thank you. So um, let's figure out a way to help everybody get a little bit up to date on the, on the issues, the uh, 10 items. Uh, we have them in categories. We have the protection first. So we're gonna maybe talk about all three at once. They are, of course, first and foremost uh, as part of this thing. So Jennifer, do you wanna run that part? Kind of a little bit of a what's in them, what's unnegotiated, what's too detailed, not enough detail. Um, okay, so 
the first set of um, items you all know and you've heard quite a lot about the tenant protections. There are three elements we've been spending a lot of time discussing um, and trying to come to some clarity about where there is agreement and where there is need for further discussion. So it would be helpful to hear from folks about I'm not going to go through them. I don't think you all need me to verbally tell you. Uh, you can read. It's a rent cap, some kind of just cause for eviction and legal assistance um, for those facing eviction. The um, uh, It would be helpful to know, are we you know, in the ballpark? Where is there too much detail? Where is there not enough detail? Um, I just want to note that uh, some of these points might need to be shifted into the to continue negotiating column. So that is also one of the questions I have for us as well. I'm not sure what else um, needs to be said, Michael. Any uh, conversation questions, thoughts about the first three that you want to have an opportunity to in this forum? As, as you've heard, there have been a lot of conversations, uh, so we will continue those as, as folks like, or we can have some open conversation today. Again, you have the slight disadvantage of having gotten this 20 minutes ago, so, or whatever, and um, so that makes it hard. Not a lot has moved of substance or the direction of each of these. We've moved on some numbers that we've tried to fill in a little bit. Uh, how much of rent increases, how much pay for just cause things. So those things are moving around, but the gist of the three, I think, hasn't uh, moved in a while. Hey, Mike. Yes, sir. If I could just raise one up, uh, and not to answer it, but just to raise up the question, because I, I, I facilitated the last couple of conversations, and I think this question of means testing is a real live one. And as you can see in your document, it shows up on the first element and the third element. Um, so to the extent people want to talk about that today, but I think that's one we have to wrestle to the ground. Jennifer, you want to give a little bit of color to that in terms of what that where, where we bump into things? And yeah, I'm, 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 I think maybe I'm having a hard time doing that because we are so close to the kind of wrestling things to the ground and I, I it's hard for me to act both as a facilitator of the conversation and as a person who has a particular point of view on the conversation so you know you you've all heard me in many times say means testing is a, a way in which contributes to the ongoing discrimination of people who already are at risk of being discriminated against for their income or their race or whatever and so it you know, you, you've heard firmly from my position that it shouldn't be means tested, that uh, relocation benefits in particular is what we're talking about, should not be a means tested feature of anything. Um, so I, I suppose in some ways I'm not willing to facilitate that conversation. I'm willing to take a position on that conversation. Very good. Um, and that's probably going to be the case and for the other points of negotiation, which is why they're sitting in the negotiation column, because uh, I'm not willing to facilitate uh, other people's points of view on that. So, uh, this is not so, a unique so, situation. So, yeah, so, so, so I just want to be transparent. There is a per particular limit to my capacity to moderate, uh, and maybe this is the, this right. is the limit. Resignation accepted. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> my, uh, on that piece of it. So, um, I, just to give what I think is the other side's impression and maybe it's worthy of a conversation is what I've heard is like from the apartment side or other sides when we get into these things they don't like the idea of, of giving money to and it's where's Michael we, we like to use Facebook as the classic poster child for <laughs> those people who make a lot of money but the um, they don't like the idea of giving money to people who don't need it Right, that's kind of the basics. What we've learned in this conversation, and I think it's a good example of people getting in the room with other 
um, sides of, of conversations that they don't normally get into is you go, oh, wait a minute, that's how you keep uh, low-income people oppressed because you don't rent to them because you means-tested them. And, and so it's a, it's a twist on the concept that is instinctively the other way around for the folks who would like to see it means tested. So it, it's, it's sort of like you get to the wrong place for the right reason or the right place for the wrong reason. So I think that's kind of, is that a fair statement in your role as not a moderator? <laughs> okay, so that, that's kind of the issue. And I don't know if there's a right answer or we're gonna solve it, but um, it, it hangs out there to me. So this actually feels like one that actually needs to be resolved. Um, this feels like an example, f particularly from Jennifer, in my perspective, that this could do harm. So this is a place where, you know, again, as I said a few moments ago, if we're worried about doing harm um, for our most vulnerable population, this for me feels like one of those efforts. So I would love to hear for those who feel strongly about including means testing, if it's just a dislike or if there's flexibility around moving, if, if we feel like this is a harm moment, uh, is there an alternative that those who feel like it's important for them to include it could live with? Let me, let me uh, I don't wanna put anybody on the spot, but maybe we'll end up there. Um, as having heard a lot of this, is one of the, one of the way, what was perceived to be a solution to that was if you means tested high, the money went to a housing agency. But what that doesn't solve is your initial do harm, right? So you can keep the money away from the person who doesn't deserve it because they means tested above the mean, but you still, that still messes up the process of people won't get selected. And that's the, under, that's the underlying issue, right? Okay, I think that's pretty clear. I think, I think we can privately or if, if anybody, that's your card? Oh, it's too skinny. I can't see it. There you, there you go. Thank you. It went, blended into the sh off his shirt there. Go ahead. All right. uh, so I, I'm not going to be able to speak for what Tamika said. So I have a point of view that is more like Jennifer's, which is I think there are several reasons why we should reject means testing, one of which is the comment about maintaining political consensus. And so I, I do think that the history of America is that when we limit benefits to small groups of people, they, 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 they follow a particular political path. And so I think that this way lies a very predictable conversation about um, the future of this concept if we go to means testing. So that's a political comment. I completely agree, and I think the evidence from around the country would suggest that you 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 have nothing but evidence for discrimination with means testing. And I think you have incredible evidence from the New York City experience on what happens when you adjust the cap on rent control and what it does to uh, that, uh, that experience. So I think my, my comment would be that um, at the core of this rent cap is the notion that for those of us in real estate development around the table, none of us pro formas above this level. None of us do. And if we accept the fact that we can um, live with. You're now in the rent cap, not the yeah, means but I mean, they're, they're, but, they're, but they're all tied together. I know, I'm just changing yeah. subjects. Okay, just, I wanna make sure I keep up with you. We just, we just have to accept the notion that um, we are gonna have to accept that we have to take some limits on our behavior that are informed by ethics and other values that we bring to the table. And if we're not, prepared to live with some of those things, yep. we're not gonna arrive at anything. So, I mean, to me, we're not asking folks to say, Bill, run your business as a nonprofit, right? Sometimes he does. Yeah, sometimes he does. <laughs> he's a, he, he tells me that all the time on all the deals we partner on. But yeah. I, I just, I, I do think we have to ask ourselves, is this really a, I can't do it, yeah. or is this a, it sticks in my craw, that's, that's, I don't like it. That's fair. Um, I saw Linda. Did you drop your tag? Oh, I'm with Doug. I, I thank, agree thank with you. Len. No need to say it twice. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, I think that was a good conversation. Um, other pop-out protection issues you want to banter, discuss, debate, conclude? 
All right, let's go on to. I, I did want to ask one question, and this is more directed maybe to Linda. And I know you guys were talking about the affordable housing uh, and the rent cap. Where did you guys land with that? Because right now it says the summary would uh, would not include affordable housing. Um, I wasn't there on Sunday, so I don't know if it was discussed. Um, uh, but my feeling is that, and Doug and I have talked a little bit about this, is that there may be a certain class of affordable housing that could have a different rent increase. The challenge for me particularly is the state of California's regulatory agreements and not having something that dramatically conflicts with those, particularly things like the catch-up provisions that are included in here. Um, that would be a nightmare for those of us who build affordable housing. And so my suggestion is that if we want to regulate how already restricted affordable housing increases its rents, that we need to go directly to those entities that have regulations and talk to them about mirroring something as opposed to having a state law. Because the way that HCD works is if their lawyers have conflicting legislation, we would need legislative change to do anything that might look like renovating a building that's falling down in their portfolio. And so I would worry greatly, particularly with respect to how the state regulates its own housing. They already have very strict provisions about how you can raise the rents, who you can raise them on, how you can do catch up, and anything that conflicts with that would just be a legal morass for us. So TCAC is different, and I you know, would defer to Bill. I think you would invite a hornet's nest of opposition here that you just don't really need. So that's my comment on TCAC. Okay, thank you. Shall we move? I, oh, Bill wants to talk about it. I just totally agree with everything Linda said. And, and I think the other things, just to name for folks, is um, we've really gone back and forth quite a lot on this question of this idea of banking, right. like, and what that looks like, what the cap on that should be. That is not resolved. Um, there is a significant uh, concern on the part of uh, those of us who work with tenants that uh, lack of clarity of what a cap is um, and then lack of clarity on when a banking kind of moment might happen and if that bank if that banked amount is a lot of money or a huge percentage increase then it it's both going to be hard to enforce but also it could be um, a dramatic rent increase that people won't know to expect. And so part of the idea of a rent anti-gouging cap is to create the conditions for of expectation on the part of everybody. So having huge banking percentages um, kind of undermines that principle from the perspective of the tenant folks. So this is a conversation that's ongoing. I just want to flag it for folks. It is not resolved. So, um, sorry. And then the other... Uh, the other thing that's not resolved either is this concept of, and these are kind of more like big components of the provisions. I'm sure there's lots of details in here that also are unresolved, but the, in the just cause, that just cause wouldn't go into effect for a period of time, um, which essentially means that the idea being that if someone hasn't had tenure in a place for X amount of time, then they wouldn't have the benefit of being uh, evicted only for reasons that were actual reasons. Um, so there, there's also a big concern there, and we have not gotten to a conclusion on that. I can play mod mediator, moderator for a while, if you like, because I know both sides of the arguments. Uh, I'll give you at least a little bit on the issue of banking and the for those who haven't read this in detail, it says something like rents can only go up so much. So there's number one. Then it says, but if the, if the market goes down and you haven't raised rents for four years, are you still limited to that increase? Because now you can never catch up. So the theory was banking said you could put some aside that you didn't give, a, give up in rent increases. One year, two years, whatever that amount is. What is the issue, I think, that is more important than that is not how much is banked, is the release mechanism. How fast can you let it out? So if you can only increase the rents 
times the annual normal plus a little bit more, 50% or 100% or 20%, that's going to determine how fast the rents go up from not having been raised for several years. So that's, to me, I think that what I've heard is the release mechanism really will impact what, what your rents do, not how much is in a bank. The bank is just so that you couldn't double your rents when you didn't go down for several years. So that's that issue. Um, the time is, is subjective. You know, th does somebody have full benefits beyond their current lease for having lived there for two months? Uh, it, there's no right answer. 12 months, nine months. That's the conversation, what, what seems reasonable for someone to have been a paying tenant in a building. So any thoughts or directions, Derica? Um, you're going to dis disclose your, you're going to abandon your moderator position for yeah, the moment. <laughs> it's gone. Um, but, uh, but a point that was brought up on Sunday that was, that is important to maybe daylight with everyone that, that Jackie uh, morales Ferrand from San Jose brought up around this issue. Um, you're right, Michael, that like then there's a catch-up provision, you know, the market then will allow it. The thing that Jackie pointed out that I think we need to grapple with on the do no harm provision around banking or a, another thing is that when, if the banking is extreme enough, I mean, first of all, the market often won't bear these big increases, right? And so, Correct. E, so even, sure. even when exactly. they can use their whole bank, they often will not right. because the market won't bear it. But then when the market can bear it, if the banking provision is too extreme, you're raising rents at the highest part point of the market when we always see more unjust evictions to get new tenants in to jack up the rents. It's the most vulnerable time in which the, the large increases matter. And so the bank, we have to, this is a very important one on the do no harm because it's not just sort of on the landlord side, their ability to do no harm to them and allow them to catch up to the market. That's also, if it's too high, you will, it will just contribute to an anti-displacement moment. And so I just think we need to sit with that. Denise. I think we've agreed to that problem. Just so we're all, so the whole room is clear because you and I have had conversations that the room hasn't heard. We agree that the amount of annual increase no matter what you have in the bank, you should still not be able to increase rents annually over some amount. And right now, the difference is, should you be able to increase the rent, for example, one and a half times or two times? That's the range we're talking about right now. Now, it could change. One and a half times the rent, one and a half times the cap. Yes, one and a okay. half times the cap. Sure, like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not <laughs> one and a half times the total rent. No. Okay. I mean, that's the Shannon, disadvantage of not having a lot of details that. on yeah. these, right? Um, yes, it says in writing on page five, one and a half to two times the otherwise applicable cap. So, and, and okay, remember. well, so that's the, my point though, is that we haven't, not, we don't have lack of understanding or agreement on the principle. What we don't have is agreement on the detail. So yeah. that's not uncommon in a lot of these term sheets where we have agreement I, I, on the principle, I we think, don't quite have agreement on the detail. I think we will get through this issue. So. I'd like to recommend we talk about others. I, I, Josh. I will try to be brief on this one, but I think this is a point where we're finding ourselves hovering between too much detail and not enough detail. And on the anti-gouging cap, I think we would be better served not getting into this level of minute detail mm -hmm. because we will never come to agreement then it goes to Sacramento when you bring in all the different interest groups and it will completely implode and look like something completely different than what we talked about here today. So I'd like to recommend, or I would just say that maybe on this, we agree that we want to protect renters from unreasonable rent increases and define what an unreasonable rent increase is and say we want to I'm not saying I can support this, but I'm saying this might be at least a conversation point, is put out there to Denise's point. What is allowable under banking? What is an unreasonable or an excessive rent increase? The other piece in this we also, that I would argue, we need to make sure we keep cities accountable. And if, they're, if we're gonna impose or support in any way some sort of an anti-gouging cap, 
Cities have to keep doing their job of permitting housing to get it built. Otherwise, this is for nothing. And maybe those cities that don't meet the arena numbers, this wouldn't apply. Mm -hmm. um, or we prevent cities from doing something more extreme than this anti-gouging cap. So a city couldn't adopt a new rent control ordinance that was more extreme than this. But I think this goes back to being more about principle than about detail, because this is one when it goes to Sacramento, the details will look completely, completely different. Thank you. Okay, can we do one or two more on protection? Because we got about a half an hour to try to get through the rest. Amy? Uh, just really quickly, I think that there there's some details like the numbers that maybe we can step back from, but the but the core principles around like an annual rent shock not to be not to exceed, I think is really critical. And I want to just push back on one thing about I I think that in the large market sense, you say, oh, what the market will bear or what the market won't bear. But there are so many market failures in rental housing. It's not a, it's, it's like somebody gets their rent raised and, and they won't bear it, so they leave it. And where are they going to go? They can't rent anywhere else. So they stay there and they bear an unbearable rent increase, which is what's happening now. So I just want to get away from that framing that it's not like people have choices right now, which is the problem and which is why we need to have these caps and these limits uh, because the goal is that people should have stability and certainty in their life. We know that markets like stability and certainty. Well, people in their lives like stability and certainty. So just a plug for that. Thank you. Um, last uh, comment I'll make about the uh, re to remember that the current status of our world is that all apartments built in the last couple of three decades aren't subject to any of this, other than in those cities that have rent control. So this is a positive putting one into the kitty for the people who own and manage apartments. They're saying, yeah, we'll live with rent increases that today they don't have to. So I think, again, you're going to hear the theme today is people are putting stuff in to make this thing work. and whether that's acceptable, whether it's the right number, all that set aside. I think that's one thing that I've got a sense that the big apartment guys for sure don't are not fighting. This is not a fight over. We're not willing to do that. So we'll, we'll keep that theme coming. I want you all to feel that everybody is putting something in, as we used to say, for the Gipper. So um, I don't know if there's a lot to talk about on preservation per se versus the last one. So let's see if there's any comments. And somebody want to summarize preservation? We've now included two of them, I guess, together. Um, well, uh, they're not actually preservation per se, but they have preservation components. But okay. I, I do think we need to talk about them. So the next two are we've divided the compact into three, four big intellectual groupings. Tenant protections, which we just talked about housing inclusion and capacity, which to, me, to my mind means enough zoning where we want housing to occur that we're not dependent on whoever happens to be the city council that year deciding whether or not they do or don't want to upzone on transit, for example, or to create more inclusionary zoning for middle income families in a bunch of neighborhoods. So we think there needs to be some, some state mandates in order to create the zoning we need in the places we need it, not everywhere, and it will not address Steve Levy's concern because the state has an intellectual agreement on density near transit. It does not have intellectual agreement on density in single family neighborhoods. Um, so I think we got to go with where people by and large agree in California and then make sure that the promise is delivered rather than just remaining empty promises that get fought about on a case by case basis. So that's those two ideas. And because we've had a lot of conversations about geography and inclusion, there is no one size fits all category. Um, and there are some places where an upzoning could cr cr do some harm, to, to, to Tamika's point. So in those places, in those sensitive communities, upzoning beyond a certain density level would be delayed for four or five years to allow community planning and agency um, and that's really the, the reframing of these issues to both 
follow the do no harm principle and follow the make it work principle because if it was working well now with the policy we, see we had in place, we'd be seeing a lot more density around transit. So that's those two. <clears throat> the next two are to create a more um, responsive, predictable, transparent process for processing housing. Anyone who's ever built housing knows you really don't know what you're going to get till you get out the end of a council approval. And many things can happen in that window. Costs can increase, rules can change. Um, planning staffs are not calibrated to do things quickly in most cities now. They're calibrated to take however much time folks in the community want to take, which typically is more time than what you really need if you're trying to scale up and build housing in a way that's impactful and meaningful. So the first one of these is, is aimed at local government planning practice. The practice of, of local planning offices needs to retool to get housing approvals able to be done in a year and to make transparent their rules and fees at, at, right at the counter when an applicant comes in. So that's the first one. And then the second one says that in order to actually get it done in a year, you need a state CEQA exemption because otherwise CEQA monkey messes up the time framing. And, in, in, and then we want also to achieve not only our CEQA goals, but our other social goals for housing, including fair wages and fair labor standards, on-site affordability, um, and the ability to pair those goals with sufficient funds that it is scalable and impactful and becomes the primary way housing gets processed in California on an expedited basis. So, it, it, you know, one is just to clean up the business of how local government planning departments operate, and the other is to really change the rules under which housing is processed so that it can be done in a more time efficient manner. Um, and that's, that's those two. And then lastly, there's the regional funding and coordination, which are the funding mechanisms and the um, regional agency. So, so that's the, the, the big picture, and I think if folks have had time to read the details, we can go through them, or they can just react to the big picture ideas. Um, Mary? Um, I can't imagine ever objecting to limiting the impact of CEQA, but the fact that the um, Compact 7 is specific to SB 35, as a, I, I'm missing your more generalized description of this, Denise, it sounded like it was more broad than SB 35, and I have some concerns that I think we're, are worth digging into with uh, limitations on what sites are eligible under SB 35. Sorry, uh, concerns about limiting uh, seven just to SB 35 if that's what's recommended here and think that we should spend more time digging into what sites are eligible under SB 35 which um, seem limited. I think that's a really good point. We have not delved into that but I think that's an important body of work as well. If, if SB 35 becomes our streamlining mechanism for most housing we got to make sure that most housing can actually be eligible for SB 35 just on the you know, physical limitations and so forth. So that we haven't done that yet, but that could be an example of things that we would recommend maybe rather than try to actually do them and say, you know, actually SB 35 needs to be able to be applied more broadly and, and ask that question. Yeah, or styled after SB 35 as opposed to quote unquote, I, you can verbiage it better than I can, but um, it just, it, the way it reads right now, it sounds like it's only SB 35. Bill. Um, I would simply reinforce that point. Um, I've long observed that as aggressive as cities, certainly like San Francisco, have become in um, supporting new housing, um, if we don't address the question of how long it takes for, I'll say, certain housing with certain conditions to get approved, you will never move the needle. I don't care how big the pipeline is. In Seattle, a very progressive city, an entitlement is 8 to 15 months. And I'm not debating that there shouldn't be conditions attached to such approvals, only that 
if you do whatever is ultimately agreed on, if you don't do something about CEQA and all that, not getting rid of it, but the time issue, it takes three years to get affordable housing projects approved. That is ridiculous. It's not sustainable, and it adds to cost. So if we want to move the needle at every level of housing and affordability, I think the, this area certainly needs to be explored. Um, I, um, so I look forward to more conversations about the sensitive communities um, component. Um, I didn't have time to look at the maps and the attachments related to that topic, but certainly seeing um, where they are, um, seeing if there can be performance standards that are attached to them. So in X number of years, if there's more time to do more planning, it still needs to come with the standards of, I guess you could say, what would be the additional number of units in this area had there not been this time delay for incorporation. Um, and also thinking through with that, there's a, if there's a delay for five years, would that then need to go through a CEQA approval process separate from compact here that's going through Sacramento sooner? Um, and what happens if that gets delayed or if that doesn't get CEQA approval? Um, so I'm trying to think through the, uh, the environmental approval process for the sensitive communities part, which will be lagging behind, will be something we should also think through. Mary, did we cover you or you put your, are you put your thingy down, whatever that's called, name tag? Uh, otherwise, I'll call on you again. Uh, okay, last thoughts, all right. Uh, oh, Jeff, Je I can never see yours. <laughs> it's because he's got a white shirt and I, I keep. I'm doing everything I can. I, keep I, uh, <laughs> I, I guess I have I just a couple comments. They're, they're both, I think, generally supportive of the effort. Um, I do think that there's a level of detail here that we're at the risk of getting into that we're not capable of solving now and we're not going to be capable of solving in 12 days. Um, I, I do think, apropos of the comment about some of this is going to move to another playing field when it gets to Sacramento, is in abundantly true about you know anything that touches SB 35 or anything that touches state density bonus laws. So I think I think we would be better served to say this is in the right direction. We recognize that this is a broader debate. It may not even be a Bay Area only resolution that 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 comes about on this particular set of things. It may be. I don't know. Um, but the other comment, back to Stephen Levy's comment earlier in the process, I do think we really need to acknowledge that um, uh, we, we, when I read this, I thought about the way we currently fund affordable housing and the way we currently fund local government. And it seems to me that if we are really intent on doing what Bill and others have said, which is we're really going to move the dial, not incrementally, but dramatically, I think we have to recognize that we, we are going to need to do something different about the funding of local government, and we're going to have to do something different about our expectations around inclusion of affordability and how we pay for that. I don't personally believe that the state of California and the way we would do it is the way that is proposed in here. I, I don't think that proposing 15-year property tax exemptions is actually the right solution. So I, I don't want to I don't want to say I don't think the proposal is good. I think the proposal is excellent, but I think we ought to acknowledge that that requires a much larger conversation around how we're going to fund local government services and affordable housing and still put forward the, the overall goal and try to figure out how we, how we both um, enable those projects to be financially feasible and enable local government to, to continue to do its job. Uh, hold that thought because Steve, Steve, who left, is going to, when we get to the funding mechanism, it's an important part of that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Matt? I would say a, a big word of thanks for all of the folks who have put in so much effort in the last short period of time to, to get us to this stage. Uh, I think that this is, we continue to make great progress in the right direction. Um, I, I think that there's uh, more work to be done as we figure out what are the right levels of feasibility um, for financing so that we are achieving the levels of affordability that we, that we want to see while also making sure that we're creating the, the, the pipeline of, uh, of production overall 
um, while creating the quality jobs. And so I really encourage all of the folks who are working deeply on that to, to, to keep working at it because I think we can find a place where um, we, we find a balance point. And I'm really appreciative of the fact that there is a heavy amount of data that's, that's starting to be infused into that process. And so to the extent that we can keep um, the, the third party objective data funneling into that, that those decisions about finding the balance point, um, the more the better. Um, uh, I, I would also say that I'm, I'm appreciative as, as well as that we've been honing in on this transit area focus because it is um, uh, in alignment with uh, so many of our goals here in the region and I think that that will simplify the process of securing the broader approval that we need to move many of these ideas forward. Um, and I would just raise as a, as a thought exercise for all of us about um, is the um, uh, the 75 foot height limit um, in the zoning standards piece larger than we can accomplish in terms of finding political consensus to get something big and bold accomplished. Um, I think we should be big and bold. I think that it would be very helpful to have those policies available to us around the region. And I also, knowing what needs to happen in terms of finding consensus with um, our partners in local government, is, is that something that's uh, too ambitious coming out of the gate? I'm not sure, I just put that out there for, for consideration by the group. Um, and a, a last thought is on the backsliding provisions. Um, there's, there's provisions that are looking at prohibiting down zoning uh, to avoid compliance with state housing law. I would just uh, encourage us to make sure that those are focused on our, our infill areas so that if we are protecting uh, natural or agricultural lands, we're not suddenly prohibiting that protection by, uh, by having that sort of uh, uh, prevention against density reductions in the right places. Thank you. Uh, let's see, going around. Scott, and then Amy, and then Jennifer. So this is one of perhaps three elements that are pretty critical, or sets of elements that are critical from a building trades labor perspective. And so, so sort of getting, getting a sense of the magnitude of scope as uh, Mary raised the question of sort of what degree of, of coverage of scope uh, an SB 35 like reworking would, would have is, is important um, because it affects whether or not we deal with the critical worker shortage issue. I mean, I just looked at today's unemployment numbers. We're at two and a half percent unemployment in all the Bay Area's metro areas, which partly explains why only 56 houses in Santa Rosa, where they don't have entitlement problems, they don't have, you know, the problems of, of necessarily capital. What they have is a, is a production infrastructure problem there that is limiting things. So. Again, magnitude of the issue, is, uh, the problem confronting that is key. And I just want to tick off, you know, um, Mike mentioned the kitty and what people have put in. And, and pardon me for, for getting into preaching mode a little bit here. But for 30 years have, in California's housing sector, workers have been putting into that kitty through 40% deterioration of their, of their wages purchasing power from the elimination of fringe benefits like health care insurance and retirement. During the housing boom, 25 workers in California died annually on average during the housing boom because they work in the highest risk industry out there, aside from driving trucks. They also face the highest economic risk because two years from now, poof, the cycle's done, they're out of work. So. What's the compensation for all that risk? Well, it's been increasingly kind of me mediocre at best wages, which is why the only area where we're seeing community college training produce c construction craft workers is electricians, where the standards are highly, more highly regulated and where wages are increasing. So we've also put in as carpenters into the kitty in a more sort of uh, quotidian way sense, dedication to trying to see the world through the eyes of developers and trying to solve for the math problem. We're spending time, we're spending money on it, uh, and we're gonna, it's just gonna take some time to try to figure out how the math problem works. 
Um, but at the same time, we're being cast as, as part of the problem on, on displacement. Um, we also put into the kitty $20 million per year out of Northern California carpenters' wages. It comes out of their wages to have a workforce development program so that we can build things. That's, a, that's in the kitty. And we have put into the kitty an unpopular, politically somewhat toxic commitment to off-site factory built housing production, uh, which hopefully will be producing a thousand or so units per year for the Bay Area. Uh, it's not been a popular position. So with those items in the kitty, I want to I want to highlight that it's important for us to be able to arrive at at relatively, you know, this is this balance between detail and vagueness, is, is to make that political leap holding hands, we need to have some sense that it's actually going to do something on a scale that's going to be worth and pay off for all that political risk. Um, so, so with that, again, you know, the details here have to do with defining maps, because as it is, most of the Bay Area uh, SB 35 map is defined to have a 50% inclusionary requirement. That's that's a pro that's a problem for production, yep. and 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 that's something that we're going to have to hash through because I've heard very clearly in the last two weeks that there's a big pinch point around that. And so, next week's Thanksgiving, um, phone phone conversations. We're going to need to have lots of phone conversations. Uh, so Thanks. so I'd highlight the inclusionary standard. I appreciate Doug, Doug's comment about the, re, you know, the political realism questions surrounding all the other takeaways from city revenues. Steve Levy made the point earlier as well that there's got to be that balance or else it's going to be a failed, failed venture. So with that, uh, uh, that's why I'm concerned about December 3rd. Um, I want to get there on principle. Bob, my, prin my principal officer and on the steering committee wants to try to get there. And, and we're going to see if we can't uh, continue to work collaboratively with you to get there. Okay. Thank you. Could we, um, in deference to time, if you're trying to suggest a, an issue or an item you want to focus on, try to keep it a little bit briefer and because um, we're not going to get through this. And unless, if everybody's willing to stay to one, we can solve that. But if people are committed to get out of here at 1230, this will be a challenge. And, and some of the juicy stuff is ahead of us with the funding mechanism that everybody wants to get to. So, Amy, with that in mind, please. Uh, yeah, I um, really want to echo Doug's framing that there's a bucket here about how we fund local government, how we fund services, how we fund affordable housing that has to be cracked if we want to understand how we're going to meet minimum labor standards, if we're going to understand how we're going to do inclusionary, what percentage, what AMI. Um, one thing, and I, th I think that's part of the, this compact, and so hopefully as we hone in on that, we can see how those pieces uh, lay out together. Um, I do want to point out that on page 11, I really like the fee on high-priced units. I think that was Denise's uh, concept put in there, but it's put under the category of labor <coughs> concerns, and that, and then there isn't something else in there, so I think that's just... That's just a typo. Okay, so I'd, those things I think would be great to get those spelled out um, better. I'll Sorry. keep it. Jennifer, forward. what role are you playing? Advocate role. There you go. Um, All right. I think we're headed in the right direction by building in some of the um, anti-displacement components around like no net loss things when it comes to some of the production proposals and that we've worked really hard to try to kind of nest these things together so they're not totally separate. Um, and I appreciate the work being done on that. Um, I think from my perspective, the, the, net, the, 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 uh, S, the SB 35 proposal, the, as we've been saying it as a shorthand, is probably the most challenging and uns, unresolved piece that's sitting here right now. Um, and for all the reasons that folks had mentioned, and I, and I want to just underscore that, it is going to be a challenge. And so, you know, it, I think we need to consider in what arena that discussion should be sitting. Linda. 
So I, I'm going to wear a moderator hat on this one because, frankly, SB 35 works just fine for Eden housing on my 50 units in Marin County, which may be the only 50 units that ever gets built in the <laughs> particular city that I'm working in. So I, I don't think SB 35 in its current iteration is working for anybody in this room in the way that it needs to. The goal here is to get to some compromise on this so that we can actually do what Bill is talking about, which is build more housing more quickly. And so. I hear what people are saying. We're unsettled because 50% felt really good, but 50%, let's face it, on affordability is not super feasible unless you have a site the size of Valco. Every other site that might be 250 units is not going to get there. And so I really think we got to come to some numbers that people can get their head around and get to the legislature with in some level of agreement. And, you know, Similar to Alameda County on the bonds, we got to agreement with labor about where certain kinds of standards would kick in so as not to unduly harm small projects. And I really think we got to think about that. And so I would just put this out there. This is really where, in my worldview, we can build some real housing. Because right now, having been to court with the Housing Accountability Act, it's not so easy with what we've got. It's easier. But this is really a place where we could make a big difference. So I would encourage everybody who's got their issues, um, the time is now to say what they are. Because if we went together, this could really happen, is my worldview. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Abby? So I just want to quickly build on what Scott said here. Um, when I look at the, the index of what is in here, and I was waiting for us to get to an agenda item that was about, are these the correct principles? And I'm not sure we're gonna get there today, so I do just wanna say, I'm, I'm not part of these, the side conversations taking place on these issues, and I know there have been many, and people have been spending time, but to not see grow the construction industry workforce as a core principle of this, I think is really problematic, um, because if, if I were an outsider, just kind of looking at what the Bay Area's problems were, that's obvious to I think everybody in this room and so to not see it as one of the you know 10 or 11 strategies here I just think we really need to think about framing and take a step back and look at this list and this this list of just 10 sentences and is it the right 10 sentences and if, if that's not there I just I can speak very very strongly as a as a BART employee who watches us with our own recruitment problem that this you know this 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 transcends housing so Robert? I'm concerned that there's not enough in here for um, promoting the concept of uh, home ownership for the missing middle. That's a real big issue throughout the Bay Area. People should not have to drive all the way to Stockton, Lathrop, and other parts of this wonderful state because um, chances are there's going to be, you'll now be uh, taxed to drive to work in Oakland and San Francisco. So um, thanks to Denise and Jonathan, there's some provisions in here where small lot, uh, small houses will be uh, are, uh, uh, will be built. I believe there's something in here dealing with uh, construction defect litigation, uh, and, and the whole purpose of that is to encourage uh, condominium developers to build um, affordable condos um, where people can buy uh, into a condo for less than seven hundred thousand. Um, uh, so, and then also, uh, I'd like to see in the use of public land that some of that land be used, uh, be eligible for to build uh, affordable home ownership units mm -hmm. and, and probably condos. Mary, you're uh, on purpose, and then we'll finish with Andreas. Sorry, usually I'm loud enough to be heard wherever, but anyway, uh, uh, agreeing with what Linda said, you said, Abby, um, but uh, getting back again uh, with regards to surplus land and also with regards to quote unquote SB 35, I think the core principle ought to be to do whatever to we need to do to expand sites that can be built on for housing. And okay, so heresy, warning, for the sensitive, I, I don't personally give a damn. I mean, there isn't enough transit in the Bay Area to make everything transit friendly. 
we need to build wherever we can build. Maybe we prioritize and, and encourage and deeply more, I, I don't know how we do it, but you know, make transit the first priority. But why aren't we opening up commercial sites all over the Bay Area to have housing automatically zoned there? Okay, maybe politically this isn't possible, but I'm a heretic, what can I say? <laughs> it just, you know, again, the, the same lecture, you know, looking at the empty parking lots with a, a fried egg development with a, with a, a, a target market in the middle it's criminal. And if we don't go there, we're never going to have enough sites that we can afford to get. So um, somebody way smarter than me has got to figure this out. But we need to get beyond this collar that we're imposing on ourselves that we have to be transit friendly. Yes, we should maximize anything that is transit friendly. But trust me, you market rate guys love you, but you're going to buy all those sites up anyway and put them at prices that we can't afford. And all our people, uh, you know, 99% affordable, are going to get squeezed back out to West Jesus, Stockton, et cetera. So we actually have on page 10 a line item. And, and you know, th this is where we get in the weeds in these meetings. It's the last line. Housing overlay to mid-range density should be created on low FAR sites on commercial and institutional sites. And then there was some blowback about, well, now you're rezoning you know, the suburbs. So we added in in-transit corridors as a result of that round of conversations. We could just as easily vote to delete the words in-transit corridors. And then we accomplish, Mary, what you're suggesting. We should be rezoning sites that are low density, not near transit, because they're not displacing anybody to replace the craptastic mall. You know, there's no displacement there, and, and you're getting rid of a arguably under market valued use, probably in a very high value residential market. And, and they're the only big sites are, we have. They're yeah, like, half those malls are going bankrupt anyway. So, right. I, so yeah, we can yeah, do that. Thank you. I, I'm sorry I missed that. I didn't I get a chance to really get no, into okay. the detail here. That's all right. No worries. And okay, let's let's wrap up with Andreas and then move on. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to follow up. I oh, think what God, somebody put their card up. Sorry. Oh, okay. Andreas. What? Um, <laughs> I think the discussion that Scott started, and I think that how, um, even though she hasn't par participated in a lot of the side meetings, she put it very, very well, Abby, your, your comments about, um, you know, the labor shortages. And again, I want to say that, you know, we've, we, I always feel like when we, we talk about the issue of labor standards, it's always a barrier um, and something to be overcome and the math to be overcome. And, and again, as I think as Scott mentioned earlier, it really has to be seen as part of the solution. Uh, and I know that, Tamika, we sat down and had a conversation about that, and you've actually drafted some, some things that we need to follow up on. Um, but I, you know, if, if, there, if there aren't qualified people to build a housing, it's not going to get built. Um, and let me just take the electricians, for example. I got lots of projects where um, they're not any or enough or electrical bids are way too high because there's not enough contractors and not an, and there's not enough co contractors because there's not enough qualified workers to do the work. Um, and you know, looking at the apprenticeship programs, they've got a huge dilemma. I mean, you know, do they ramp up immensely now and start trying to fill the need? And in three years from now, when things go down, they've got a, this mass of you know apprentices that have just turned out and they're out of work. Um, if you're not expanding union market share, that's a problem. That is a serious problem. The non-union is not going to train these workers. They don't have the structure set up in place. Non-union contractors are competing with each other, so they're not going to train somebody that their competitor is going to take away. Community colleges are not going to be uh, able to establish apprenticeship programs because they don't put people onto the job, and, and apprenticeship is learning on the job. It's the you know, the union labor management programs are going to do that. And we, if we don't start addressing that issue as part of a solution, so I would actually second what Abby indicated. I think maybe we need to look at this a little differently instead of us always kind of they're trying to throw the monkey wrench into stuff, is let's make, you know, this issue of labor supply a compact element and so we can kind of dig a little deeper in there and kind of see what we can do to support, uh, you know, expanding the supply of qualified workers. As a statement of principle, exactly. You know, so, and I think that changes the dynamic, especially when we're going to Sacramento, when we're putting something in front of, you know, building trades lobbyists or other words and saying, well, wait a minute, we got to react to this. No, what is it, you know, how do we, how are we part of the solution onto this? So um, here's some um, real time feedback. Write it up. Give us a, give us a, give us a, a line item of what you'd like it to say. No one has ever fought the idea we need more workers. Uh, no one has ever fought the idea a union has a role, a big role.
maybe not 100 percent, and that's where the disagreement comes. But um, I think this group would be willing to entertain something that said, look, here's the labor package. Uh, help us write it up. You know it better than we do. So that would be great. So, what we had so can, can let me yeah, let me sorry. let me. Uh, okay, I need to know who's going to leave, and who can stay till one because you're overly passionate and committed, and mm -hmm. this is more important than your day job. And so, can we drag this out for another half hour and try to get through this? Is that generally okay? I'll take that so, as a yes. Other than Bill. So, I do have to leave to speak at an, another event, so I wanted to get one comment in. I yes. would endorse the labor supply question. I, I think that's a good compact yep. ad. Yep. But to Doug's point, I can pick on him because he's not here. Um, I understand the need about local government funding and not moving so quickly on things like property tax exemptions, but Linda or somebody help me if I'm wrong here. In order to Fun, help fund affordable housing beyond donation or reduction of land cost of publicly owned land, state or local direct subsidies from bond proceeds or whatever, or property tax exemptions. There is no other way. So since there isn't another way, I wouldn't be so quick to dismiss that. I just leave everybody with that thought. Thank you. Okay, can we do the speed process stuff? I was just going to suggest that we meet and go through this some more, but to let you know that we heard the comments, we thought we'd embrace them. We obviously didn't do enough. We've now added language about labor standards in the public lands compact. We've added standards in the public funding compact. We've added changes to the ADU compact so that we're not encouraging the underground economy. And I think it's a great idea to have a separate compact item that cross-references those sections so it's clear to the uninitiated and that we add more if we need it. Like maybe we need some of the public funding to go pay for apprentices so it's not just coming out of worker wages. I don't know, as Mike said, write it up, but you know, what else do we, what else should we do? Because we took the ideas that had been put on the table and we thought we wrapped them in. So let's yeah. do all the above. Yeah, that's brilliant. Okay, who wants to do the three, Denise, I assume? Speed, or are we done with? We did all three of those? You combined them all. Okay, so we can get to regional housing then? We didn't do public land, did we? You know, maybe the only other thing we want to do is to go back to the question of on-site. I would like to hear what the room thinks about the question of on-site affordable inclusion requirements in SB 35. The current standard is 50% in arena compliant city. Arena compliant city means that the market functions well and people make enough money to pay for new housing so builders are able to build new housing in those places where they can get it approved. There are places where they can't get it approved. Um, but we'll, you know, th those were probably the arena non-compliant high income cities. What that means is that no market rate builder can use SB 35 in places where the market works. And we're obviously not going to use it in places where it doesn't work because we can't cover construction costs. So it effectively means no one that's a market rate developer can use SB 35 at all. And the only way to fix that is to lower that inclusionary requirement enough that you can pay for the on-site inclusion, which the early math from Turner Center said you can't even afford 15% at 80% without some form of public subsidy. That's what the math has indicated. So if we're, if we're solving for a 15% on-site inclusion, then maybe we can get that to work with the public subsidy that we're talking about here. But if we're solving for 40%, 30%, 25%, even maybe 20%, I don't know that we can get there and get the math to work. And it all comes down to, for developers, even though this is an anathema to people who are worried about real people, if you, developers won't build to lose money. And so if we want more housing, they have to be able to make enough money to do those deals. And that right now, that big dial is the inclusionary requirement. So I'd like to hear some dialogue about, and there's two ways to do it. It's an on-site percentage, so 15%, 20%, some on-site amount, and who you're targeting it to. Are you targeting it to the missing middle? That's easier to do than if you're targeting it to people who make 80% of area median. So it would be helpful let, just to hear me, some feedback. Let me also frame the, the developer plate. Um, which no one really cares about, but 
What it is is the pension funds, CalPERS, CalSTRS, all the pension funds are our partners. They invest in projects with every developer you know. And they won't accept a return of 3% or 4%. So when we're solving for math, we're trying to get them the return they need to pay the pension uh, requirements. So think about it in those contexts that it is everybody in the room who has a pension in one of those systems that we're arguing we have to be able to satisfy that beast. So it's, it's within that context, not the, the developer who manages to hit it out of the park and makes a, a big fortune. It's, it's really those are the thresholds. So when we talk about being able to control rent increases and make enough rent increase, it's always for our partners and anybody around the room can, can say the same thing. So just keep that in mind. But, but I think the amount of affordable is, the, is an issue we need to try to rapple, grapple with. Uh, Amy, were you on this point? Um, <clears throat> so this is the age-old debate, and it's hard to have it here in this context. But I, do, I would say this, which is that geography matters. And so uh, this is why you know, one blanket standard doesn't work very well, and there should be, we should really look at the geography proposal uh, for indicators of how to move forward with this. It is clear that, that the affordability standard does need to be adjusted if we want to use it as a production tool. The question is, is what else gets adjusted? How are we backfilling that affordability resource through revenue? So I'm really excited to talk about the revenue proposals and the enterprise. I really want to get there. Uh, because I think that there are ways that we can, if we get support for additional revenue for affordable housing, we can say that maybe it's the inclusionary component that goes to the missing middle, that that's a, a way to get there and a way to meet that need, whereas public subsidies should go to deeper levels of affordability. I think there's a way to talk about these things. Um, so do we want to back in and talk money? Can, can I just uh, make sure. my last comment, which is just that we feel really strongly that what was um, passed with AB 1505, the Palmer inclusionary fix, that should be the regulatory scheme to monitor inclusionary as opposed to what's being proposed here. We, we feel really strongly uh, around AB 1505. Yes, happy to talk about money. Yeah, do you want to uh, divert the uh, conversation towards how do we pay for this? How do we pay for this? <laughs> we got this down to a science. This is We're exactly in the home stretch. Exactly this is going to be really precise. easy. So I'm, I'm going to just use a few slides just to focus attention a little bit. Um, and I'm going to go to element number 10 first to talk about the money. Uh, a lot of what has been discussed thus far today will require money, whether it's preservation, uh, right to legal counsel. There's no funding for that right now. Affordable housing, same thing. Uh, inadequate money, uh, preservation of affordable housing. We've calculated the need uh, for what is in the draft CASA compact to cost on the in the neighborhood of $2.5 billion. Uh, we have brought to the technical committee a number of times some various funding proposals. Uh, we first came out with, I believe, 16 different items. Uh, they, were, they were targeted at $100 million a piece, so we sort of showed what it would take to achieve $100 million for one of the revenue components. Uh, we then more recently came with more of a proposal of what we thought might be, might be more salient using the same, uh, this is hard and this would impact different constituencies but not just focus on a constituency approach. The feedback then was that, well, that's probably going too far. Uh, we should give some good ideas to the legislature and they're going to figure this out. Uh, and so that's kind of where we are with what you see on the screen here today. Um, it's the same general concept that when we have a hole this big in terms of affordable housing, in terms of um, funding, uh, preservation mechanisms, and so forth, uh, particularly at the regional level uh, where housing is largely not supported at this point, um, and to some degree at the local and state level, that it will take a lot of different resources uh, coming together to, to fund what is in CASA. If, if I could mention as well, I, I guess we had a missing link earlier <laughs> in the week. We, we've got two missing boxes here. Uh, there are supposed to be two ideas per category. I believe the missing box for local government 
is some form of revenue sharing, as is done in Minneapolis. Right. And the missing box for taxpayers is GO bonds, which we've been, I, I think, fairly successful with, but they're a little bit uh, difficult in terms of ongoing revenue because you have to keep passing them every few years. Uh, so the idea is to sort of lay out a menu of revenue options for the legislature. We had initially been driving toward a proposal um, of one per each category, and I, I think the co-chairs and a lot of you talked us out of that. Um, and so uh, if you've got a menu, obviously you can, the menu could be as long as your arm. Uh, I do think it makes sense not to give them too many choices uh, because we'll get blamed for each one. Uh, but I, I think the notion of having a couple in each category sort of gives the legislature the flexibility to pick and choose and try to put together a package uh, that approaches the shortfall we have, but we're not proposing that this self-help agenda cover the whole nut, which is two and a half billion dollars. What we're suggesting is that we bite off about a billion and a half and then try to get the rest from the state and from the federal government, which is under new management, at least part of it is. So with that, I will cover the other component, which is element number nine. Um, if there are resources available for housing and the various protection, preservation, uh, production components, um, arguably there needs to be an entity to distribute the funding uh, to also provide technical assistance. Uh, we think you know, one of the things that was really lost with redevelopment, particularly in mid-sized cities and smaller cities, was capacity uh, to fund uh, various components of housing. Um, and there has been quite a bit of discussion to date about what a regional housing enterprise might look like. Some of that's represented here on the screen. Um, as proposed, it would build upon some of the work that is already done at the regional level, but go beyond that to provide more financial uh, capability, enhanced technical assistance, uh, monitoring and reporting in terms of state laws that exist and might exist in the future relative to jurisdictions. Um, and with a lens toward racial equity, um, equities infused throughout what CASA is trying to do. So really trying to make sure that what would be moving forward was benefiting folks in, in the region in a way that is truly equitable. Um, what is not being proposed is that this would be a regulatory entity. Uh, the general discussion, the feedback we've had to date is that mixing up regulation with technical assistance, with funding, with something that's essentially there to help get things done and to be a resource for local jurisdictions and uh, to just get more housing built in and more equitably so, uh, that that probably wouldn't mix so well with regulation. So that's not being proposed. Lastly, I'll just mention that in terms of governance, um, there, there's been discussion about you know, what the governance might be. This proposal uh, would call for an independent board. It would be staffed by MTC and ABAG. It would have representation from MTC as well as ABAG, and it would include key stakeholders that are to some degree represented um, in terms of the um, issue areas on CASA. And with that, I think I will stop, and we can try to take your questions and comments. Okay, we'll go around the room. Uh, Derek. I just have a question. I missed it. Um, independent board with represent elected board, um, independent board of AP, a MTC, ABAG. Like, what's how's the board? So not elected. Uh, that's been discussed, but that that is uh, not something we've heard a lot of support for. Um, <laughs> one approach could be that MTC would support or would um, appoint seats, ABAG would appoint seats. Um, a combination of the two agencies could appoint stakeholders. Um, there's been some discussion that perhaps the state could do that. That, that would be in the details. Matt. Thanks. Uh, just want to again compliment the staff and all the work on these proposals. And um, I do want to take a little bit of an issue with the assumption that the federal government is now under new management and is going to step in with any significant resources anytime soon. Um, so let's just be realistic. If we're looking for a match here, it's going to have to come from the state. And I think that this body is going to need to make a clear proposal for what that should be. I actually have such a proposal. 
um, and would love to circulate it. Uh, whether or not it gets into CASA, it's going to be under discussion because the new governor is making that an issue. Yes. Please do. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, I think most of you know the enterprise has been working on this entity for quite a while, and we support this really strongly. Um, and while it won't be regulatory, won't have re regulatory powers, I think ultimately it should have carrots and sticks to convince people to mm -hmm. to Play nice. not so much punish people, but to convince people as well to to build affordable housing. So I think those those kind of things. It, it should be a fairly powerful organization ultimately. Good. Thank you. So um, you can tell, I suspect, that while the compact is critical and we are somewhere between it's too detailed and not detailed or it's not perfect, it still has to go through the process we described and then it's got to go through this financial uh, menagerie of um, sources to pay for these things. And as Steve said, the co-chairs felt when we got down to five, it was like, and, you know, we didn't know which was the right five and what the objections are going to be and income taxes, you know, pejorative word. Uh, so what we decided was to try to back it up to a little bit more of a menu. They, they, um, uh, and they, again, we don't control this. So this is just our best shot at trying to give some math to the legislators who will have to take our compact. And again, I want to reemphasize it's in one piece, one compact and now go figure out how to finance the, the pieces of it that, you know, it's their day-to-day -day life. So just to put that in perspective. Linda. So just a comment, um, having looked at the data for the Bay Area on the housing bonds that passed and the initiatives that didn't pass, we really can't get two-thirds in every county. So anything that we can do to get the legislature to put whatever it is we need on the ballot so that we're going in the 50 plus one mode really needs to be a top priority for all of us because if we think we're gonna take some of this stuff, nine county, Bay Area wide with the two thirds, I just don't think we, unless all of you wanna write really, really, really big checks, uh, and even then, I'm not sure we could get there. So I, I just, you know, we saw the numbers. We've looked at every county. We're looking at every county in the state. I think two-thirds is a very heavy lift, and so I would encourage us to make that threshold 50 plus one in whatever way we can. Because we're also in charge of that. Well, okay. the legislature, if they, I mean, it really, if they could, if they could get the two-thirds to put this on, and I think the real yeah. question is going to be what other regions get to do it, and then, yeah. you know, so. Yeah. Okay, I think we're done except for Amy. Yep. Uh, last words. Yes, I strongly want to echo that <clears throat> it's critical for housing to be like the school bonds, to be able to win bonds at 55%. Um, that is something that is doable. Getting to two-thirds is an incredibly steep climb. So for us, it's one of our top priorities to advance. It's a kind of non-negotiable for us that that should be, it's going to be a big push, um, just like Prop 13 reform and other big things, but we're stymied otherwise. Uh, the other point, the last point that I want to make is that we think that the relationship between transportation and housing is critical, and if a major regional transportation measure goes forward, housing should be part of that. We don't want to pit transportation and housing against each other. They need to um, go forward together. And I think a statement from CASA or having that be part of the CASA process of um, endorsing that would be very important. Okay, so. You've all been waiting, right? You want to vote, right? You want to put your hand up and say what Tamika said. This is a way to, to make a point. So we have two ways we can do, we have several ways we can do this. Um, Autumn has some handouts that will give you an opportunity to physically tell us what issues you still want to talk about, what issues you still didn't get a chance to vent or negotiate. And so we will take those back. But what I'm asking is that you help the co-chairs and the moderators today. Uh, we can't get through a shortened process uh, to, de to December without really knowing where you all feel in macro. Um, one of the problems you all experience is you all came here from your own pers respective camps. 
Uh, you had issues, and the people you left behind at the office haven't been in this process. Only you people have been in this process. Only you have sat in all these meetings and have heard both sides. Uh, I've heard things I never knew. I assume you all have as well. So only your opinion matters in saying, hey, we're not trying to do perfection. It may be bold. We're not sure yet. It may really move the needle on housing, but we got to try it. And so with some uh, effort over the next two to three weeks of refining this, what we really need to hear from you is that the compact feels like it's on the right path. The compact includes the protection items that are important enough. We don't have the percentages, but they're in there. The preservation, the production of affordable and market rate, what we call missing middle, are all in there. And that, as if I could channel Tamika or um, her enthusiasm, it's time. And so I, we'd like you to say you believe that the compact is on the right path. It's not done. It's got to go to the steering committee, all that other stuff. But you folks have spent the most time by far than anybody in this process. The steering committee has not put in anywhere near the hours you have on this subject, getting it down from 54 items to 17 to 10 and back up to 11. See, we're, iter we're iterative. Um, you understand the process. So it would help us if you could, and, and I don't want to do this in a complicated, long, drawn out way. So. I'm suggesting if you think you're, remember, you remember the one, two, three, four, five, one is, I get this, I'm in. I know it's going to change a little bit, but I get the idea, I'm, a, I'm for it. Two is, I'm pretty damn for it, but not quite sure. Three is, I don't know, I got no vote, which makes no sense. Four is, there's some stuff I don't like, but for the package, I can see getting there. And five, I just don't see it. So if you're willing to play, can we try it this way? Everybody who's a one, and Leslie and I decided we would vote to sort of set the tone, who thinks we're in the right place, who thinks that the work the technical committee done has been Herculean and the hours important enough to get this to the steering committee with one more round, who's a one? Everybody put your hand up if you are a one. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's okay. Two, you're pretty close. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Three, nobody should be a three. For God's sake, guys. <laughs> I understand. All right. I have to give Scott and Joshua grief. Uh, four is this is really not feeling good. And you don't you don't kinda you don't kinda get it. The moderator? Wow, that's well, I said a four was okay. I said a four was okay. It's my bad. Any fives? Anybody said I'm ready to go home? This isn't working. That's really helpful. And I, I oh, Fred, we, we took his one and counted it. Um, that's what he gets for missing. Right, Fred? Right, Fred? Okay. Trust me that. I'm a, I'm a two. Uh, all right. You're a two. <laughs> I tried to cut you off. All right, that's really helpful. Um, you will hear, you, you all have Denise's commitment. Uh, the other moderators, I believe, are in the same camp, as are your co-chairs. We want this to work. I want labor to come up with a, with a package, and, uh, and we'll give it every consideration we can because we believe in that message. And um, you will get a package next time, more than three hours before the meeting. We promise. So... All I can say is, that, Leslie, if you want to say anything, or Steve. Nope, just thank you, and uh, we got a lot of work to do. Oh I, oh, I do have one question that was asked to me. So uh, we're looking at the third. I'm not sure what time on the third. I don't think we have a time. Noon, about noon. I know at least one member who cannot come. Uh, is there a way to, for them to vote? Uh, formally, some other way. I hear the website. We can we can really try to we can make that work. Okay, because uh, I think we'd like to have all the votes. Everybody who's paid enough attention to this and enough hours. I'm not sure. One o'clock. One o'clock. December third, one o'clock. To vote final. Oh golly. Uh, it's probably a three-hour. Uh, I'm sorry, a two-hour meeting. I was down to one. <laughs>
Sure, two. <laughs> yeah, two hours. And then steering is, oh, 10 days-ish later, the 12th? Right. 12th. The 12th. So steering committee is where they are going to uh, hear it for the, today they'll hear it at 1.30 for the first time in a while, and then they, they have to really put their, put their pencils to this. Okay? Well, uh, again, for the three co-chairs and Steve, I can't thank you enough for the unbelievable amount of work you've put in, the hours committed to this, and uh, we're going to make it pay off. So thank you all. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>